uh, MS is uh, one of the most um, commonest conditions that causes disability in young people all over the world. So um, it, it has a significant uh, impact, so not only on the person, but their family, and uh, also the whole society. While the disease-modifying treatments have had um, sort of uh, explosion now, that the, the newer drugs are coming and more and more effective treatments are coming, there hasn't been really that much, that much progress uh, with um, symptomatic treatments. So we are still using the old drugs for spasticity, for bladder management, for fatigue. There, there's not really a very good treatment. Unfortunately, patients with MS will continue to have symptoms because we cannot diagnose MS before they have had symptoms. We, we haven't found prevention. So we may slow down the condition, but they still have a um, lot of symptoms. And obviously, as the MS population is aging, these symptoms will also cause more problems. So um, it's important to be able to recognize symptoms, assess them, treat them, and also um, help patients um, understand and manage their symptoms uh, uh, and, and be able to fulfill their personal, occupational, as well as social role. So MS causes problems almost all over the, your body, uh, perhaps except uh, maybe hearing is something quite unusual to lose with MS, but you, you get cognitive uh, and um, symptoms right up to motor, sensory, autonomic, everything. So um, cognitive and affective symptoms are very much common uh, in MS, um, as Klaus was saying earlier, about in CIS patients, uh, in about five years' time, about 50% patients will have developed cognitive difficulties. Um, they also get anxiety, depression, and other psychiatric illnesses are more common uh, with MS. Uh, there aren't really any treatments to improve cognition. It may be uh, people who have got mild uh, cognitive difficulties, some of the very um, intensive uh, psychological treatments um, uh, can be helpful, but there isn't really any good treatment, and, and really treatment is prevention. So you, you, some of the disease-modifying therapies will delay the disability, but there isn't anything that will sort of reverse the, the impairment. Um, the next one is the sleep uh, and fatigue and uh, restless legs are common. So patients can have hypersomnia, patients can have uh, insomnia difficulty with disturbed sleep. Some patients, as the disability increases, uh, obesity becomes common. They can develop obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and also, restless leg syndrome uh, can be common and also can be a, a sort of a relapse. So it, it can be uh, multifactorial. So the sleep problems may be primarily due to MS itself, or it may be because they are in pain. It may be because they have got bladder dysfunction, they're having to wake up many times, they've got spasticity, they're on medications that disturb their sleep. Um, so it's not quite as simple as just a, a symptom. You have to look out whether, whether it's primarily MS related or there are other secondary causes. Um, uh, fatigue is very difficult for patients to describe and also it's difficult to assess and measure. Often we use sort of um, fatigue severity score, which is a sort of a, a measurement of the impact of fatigue. And uh, it, it again can be quite multifactorial, so that the patient may have weakness, spasticity, they uh, may have uh, medications, anticholinergic drugs for bladder that they are taking, they're on painkillers, but they may be on uh, opiates that all cause um, drowsiness, fatigue. So it's really important to look at the whole picture and see what may be causing fatigue. Again, there are not very good treatments available. We, there are very um, small trials done previously showing some benefit with, with amantadine, uh, modafinil. Uh, modafinil is currently changed. Uh, the MHRA has restricted its use only for sleep disorders, and um, I tend to use it in patients who have fatigue along with hypersomnia, but otherwise, uh, I don't tend to use. So there's not really any uh, good uh, pharmacotherapy, and you, you have to sort of look at uh, pacing of activities. Sometimes many of the symptoms will be thermosensitive in that um, 
heat uh, sensitive, so uh, patients uh, get something called as Utos phenomena. So the demyelination causes um, slowing of the uh, uh, axonal conduction, and uh, with increased body temperature, you may develop a uh, nerve block basically causing uh, worsening of the symptoms. So a patient who may be able to walk better and, and after exertion their body temperature goes up, they may develop a foot drop and, uh, and then start um, finding it difficult, the leg starts dragging more and similarly fatigue could be uh, worsening with, with the temperature. So just cooling off techniques or so, um, reducing the room temperature maybe by one or two degrees, uh, drinking cold water, you uh, just changing uh, their um, uh, you know, clothing, appropriate clothing, can, can make a significant difference. Um, headaches um, syndromes are common, uh, and uh, pa patients with MS, obviously migraines are common in women uh, and young women, uh, but particularly higher uh, in uh, patients with MS. Trigeminal neuralgia is the, the risk of trigeminal neuralgia is 20 times more in MS population, and about one third of the patients will have bilateral trigeminal neuralgia. But all the conventional treatments used for trigeminal neuralgia also usually work for these patients. And um, uh, one of our studies showed that carefully um, selected patients who were resistant to uh, drug treatments um, responded in a similar way to uh, surgery. Uh, uh, in, in, in the way that the other um, trigeminal neuralgia patients would. So uh, coming down to um, sort of um, visual uh, brainstem symptoms and visual symptoms. So uh, optic neuritis is common in MS. About half of the patients with MS will have had optic neuritis at some point, and about 20% will have it as their first presenting symptom. So most patients do recover quite well. Uh, and, and on, a, on a snail in chart, they may look like they have a six by six vision, but often they have ongoing difficulties. They may have poor vision in the low contrast environment. They may have color desaturation. Um, they uh, can, uh, there's something called pulphric phenomenon where you have had um, optic neuritis on one side. So when, uh, when you're trying to judge movement because one eye perceives the um, signal slower, the brain thinks that uh, the movement is sort of curved. So it may not be important for some person who just maybe have a job just doing, sitting at a computer and, and uh, doing not much, whereas uh, if you are a sports person and you have to catch a ball, that, that makes a difference. So the, the symptom really depends on, uh, uh, the impact depends on what you do and how it affects that person, so it's important. Um, the brainstem symptoms, so um, patients uh, can get, um, uh, about, sort of uh, about 70% of the patients will have some for, form of um, gait or balance difficulties. Uh, about 20% will have true rotational vertigo, uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, positional vertigo uh, it is due to, uh, sort of in most patients of uh, MS who develop positional vertigo still have BPPV, so benign paroxysmal position of vertigo, which is very easily treatable by postural maneuvers rather than anything else. Um, th with uh, other eye movement disorders, they can have nystagmus, they can have internuclear ophthalmoptasia, meaning when th they're looking to move both eyes together, the eye that's moving in will move um, sort of slower or not at all, uh, and the eye that is moving out will have a nystagmus. They can have bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. They can have other eye movement disorders, whether um, um, they have vertical uh, sort of skewed deviation where their vestibular system isn't working. So the, the, <coughs> the earth vertical has changed, and therefore the eyes uh, are misaligned vertically, and they can get double vision because of that. They can develop a, what we call as a head tilt um, posture, uh, so that can be quite uh, difficult to manage and very disabling. Um, so it's again uh, important to be able to assess that, recognize that, and support these patients with that. Um, the patients will have um, sometimes uh, a very resistant nystagmus, and that gives them, a, 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 in particular, pendular nystagmus. So they have uh, oscillopsia, so they feel like their environment is sort of going sideways. Uh, and that can affect their 
sort of feeling of balance, their ability to see things clearly. Um, again, the, usually we, um, there is some um, data suggesting that gabapentin or baclofen may be helpful with these patients, and sometimes memantin can be useful. So memantin is something used uh, for uh, uh, degenerative dementias. Uh, it is important to note that the memantin, while it can improve the the nystagmus can actually make the other MS symptoms worse. It's an, an MDA receptor blocker. Um, other bulbar symptoms, if the brainstem is involved, you can get speech and swallowing difficulties. So if, if they, that will affect their communication, swallowing difficulties will affect their nutrition, they can have aspiration pneumonia. So it's important that they have access to uh, sort of speech and language therapies, assessment of swallow is important. Um, uh, pain is, is very, very common. It can be neuropathic pain coming from affection of sensory pathways. It can come from the, the bad posture because of their disability and impairment. It may be because of, of the spasm, spasticity that they get. So um, it may be worsened by um, ongoing um, depression, anxiety. So it, it's again important to, to manage um, all, the, um, all factors together rather than one symptom. Sometimes you, uh, patients continue to get a painkiller after painkiller, uh, and, and sometimes it may be just that, that if you manage the anxiety better, uh, the depression better, you can do a screening with a hospital um, a depression uh, score, and then if they, uh, uh, hospital anxiety and depression score, and if they score highly, that, that would suggest that there is a very strong element of anxiety, depression, and, and target therapy there, and that will have impact on all other different symptoms. Um, so, weakness, tremor, spasticity, again, very common. Uh, spasticity is commonly managed through uh, GABAergic drugs, um, gabapentin, uh, baclofen. Uh, there is, uh, a sort of treatment with um, Sativex now for resistant uh, spasticity, uh, though not um, available on NHS here, but it is licensed. So the, um, there is a lot of evidence that uh, the cannabis extract cannabinoids uh, are, uh, can be helpful, not only managing the, uh, the symptoms, but also possibly uh, as an immunomodulator. Um, the cannabis trial for urinary symptoms was a negative, but it, uh, sort of the sub-analysis shows that perhaps there are responders and there are non-responders, and it, so if you find the responders, and it, it may help with the symptoms. Um, the sexual dysfunction is common, but often patients may not volunteer because it's embarrassing, but it has a huge impact, so it's important to sort of uh, make them comfortable to talk about it. The, the, it happens in both men and women. In men, it may uh, uh, present as erectile dysfunction. They may have um, anorgasmia. They may have um, retrograde ejaculation that may present as infertility. So um, in, in women, again, they may have uh, sort of loss of desire. They may have anorgasmia. They may have pain. and uh, so referring them, you know, talking about it, referring them to appropriate speciality is very important. Generally, it's very important that the patients have access to multiple specialities and, uh, and sort of a, it's a multidisciplinary management uh, and that we talk to each other. Um, and, and the most important thing is basically we involve patients into the decision making. So we, we um, in, give the information, we educate them, and, and we give them uh, sort of empower them to, to decide what their treatment should be. Um, the complementary alternative therapy used in, among them as patient has always been very high, and that is a manifestation that our modern medicine isn't very um, sort of helpful, and they have to seek other ways to try and uh, improve their symptoms, and, and also um, it's important that uh, they feel that they are in some ways control of their own condition. So. Um, and always think about initially non-pharmacological non therapies, so um, aerobic exercises, um, relaxation exercises, cooling off techniques are very important before you start um, doing any um, 
multiple pharm pharmacological treatment. So, thank you.